Here's an idea. Neon Genesis Evangelion demonstrates the death of the author. For a lot of people, Neon Genesis Evangelion is not an anime, it is THE anime. Produced by famed animation studio Gainax and the Grey Matter spawn of creator Hideaki Anno, or Anno Hideaki, NGE began as a TV series airing over a five-month period starting late 1995. It follows several characters, most notably Shinji Akari, Rei Ayanami, and Asuka Langley Soryu, as they pilot massive, sorta but not really robots in the defense of Earth against truly terrifying eldritch abominations called angels. The arrangement of big robots versus giant monsters makes NGE technically a part of the anime genre called Mecha. So compare it to things like Macross, Gurren Lagann, and Big O. Except then don't, because Evangelion is sorta of another thing entirely. Where many mecha animes are all gung-ho, kill the bad guys, good show, NGE is dark. And it confronts the psychological pressure that's heaped on people, teenagers no less, who are tasked with saving the world. Characters have nervous breakdowns and struggle with depression and constructions of self. They wonder whether or not free will is even a thing. Everyone on the show has abandonment issues. Neon Genesis Evangelion is psychological and intense, philosophical and compelling. That is, unless you ask the people who made it. Anno has said, quote, it is strange that Evangelion is a hit. Everyone in it is sick. And as for the weird, amazing relationships between the characters and how they progress, he explained in an interview, whatever the story or development between the characters, I did it without a plan. Sources in the description. Hideaki has harshly criticized fans for searching out meaning where, he claims, there isn't any. So as you might expect, there's a kind of love-hate relationship with this guy. On the one hand, he's kind of a tyrant, trolling, mocking, and challenging the experiences of the very people upon whom his success depends. But on the other hand, he is the man who brought one of the most beloved animes into existence. For many NGE fans, he is a saint. His vision is of utmost importance. They know about his past and his battles with depression, that characters allegedly incorporate parts of Anno's own personality, and that production on Evangelion was always a little rocky. He's talked about tight budget its unbelievably short turnarounds and incredibly stressful production conditions. Conditions which led, however, to some conceptual, adventurous, and most importantly, inexpensive episodes. And if you count movies and director's cuts, several different series endings as well. Like a giant mecha anime onion, Evangelion has some layers to it. We can't help but wonder, though, which ones do you need in order to understand the show? Sure, I mean, you can be a total fiend and want to know everything about Anno and Evangelion and anime and everything ever, and that is fine. But if we're talking about watching, understanding, and enjoying NGE, which bits do we need? Do we need to know that Evangelion is supposed to be a comment on the over-commercialization of anime? Or that Anno thinks we're sort of dumb for buying, some of us literally, into his quote-unquote meaningless story? French philosopher, deconstructionist, and awesome hairdo have Jacques Derrida says no, and furthermore might agree with Anno that Evangelion is meaningless, just not in the way that you think. Derrida says that there is nothing outside the text. He doesn't mean that when interpreting a work you shouldn't use information external to the work itself, but that everything, every communication, is in some way textual. That there is nothing outside the text because everything is the text. Evangelion, text. Anno's interview answers, text. This YouTube video, Text. Now text is troubling because it doesn't really contain meaning. It's just a bunch of little symbols and noises that are stand-ins for the actual ideas, meaning that everything is at least a little ambiguous. In other words, to communicate, you have to use representation. You go through, quote, a detour of signs. Not a detour sign, that would be weird. Anything textual, so anything, is open to interpretation. This kind of robs the author's interpretation of its authority, doesn't it? I mean, yes, Anno was there, he saw Evangelion getting made, he knows what happened, but his actions during its creation, his feelings about them, the way he describes them, the way we read or hear them are, to phrase it as Derrida might, always already interpretation. Hideaki's comments then are unimportant because their meaning is just as ambiguous as the thing that they would disambigue shed some light on. But of course, because nothing is ever clear or easy, this idea itself is bound up inside of another conundrum. Is the role of the text, the artwork, the TV show, the sonata, the painting of the monkey, or whatever, to communicate the exact, precise thoughts of the creator? 500 years ago, the answer to that question probably would have been, well, yeah, da doy. But nowadays, it's not so clear. Mine and Derrida's main man, Roland Bart, wrote in Death of the Author that the modern writer is born simultaneously with his text. He is in no way supplied with a being which precedes or transcends his writing. He is in no way the subject of which his book is the predicate. There is no other time than that of the utterance, and every text is eternally written here 
and now. In other words, does the modern text have to convey the exact meaning of the author? Uh, no, Derrida Doy. Weirdly enough, Hideaki Anno agrees. He said, don't expect to get answers by someone. Don't expect to be catered to all the time. We all have to find our own answers. Which is coincidentally exactly what we watch Shinji, Rei, and Asuka do throughout the entirety of Evangelion. What do you guys think? Is the input of the author important when interpreting a work? Let us know in the comments. And I've been working on my Rei impression to ask you guys to subscribe. Okay, ready? Guess what? We are not in a small office corner anymore. We are at VidCon. Let's see what you guys had to say about Jurassic Park and capitalism. Colt Pale says that Jurassic Park is not so much a comment on capitalism as it is a comment on unregulated capitalism, and then goes on to make the very hilarious and astute observation that the Canadian Jurassic Park probably would have went just fine. I agree. Picky Stickman takes issue with our reading of Jurassic Park saying that we do not look at things objectively and that you have to take into account the author's intentions um, when you are interpreting something. I wonder what Picky Stickman thinks of that idea after watching our Neon Genesis Evangelion episode. Picky Stickman, are you out there? What do you think? So Turkish Radish is concerned about having their comments featured once, maybe some advice on how to make that happen. So since we're at VidCon, we'll get some experts here. Uh, first we have Nate from OK Nate. Nate, what do you think? Caps, 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 caps. There you have it, caps, all caps, all the time. And also Shannon Coffey from Coffee Chat. Shannon, what do you think? Romantic poetry, please. There we go. So some tips from pros, some pro tips on having your comments featured, Turkish Radish. Okay. Uh, thank you, friends. Do you like this? You enjoy it? Uh, yeah, it's pretty nice, actually. You're so warm. So General Cole and Daniel McLean write some really interesting comments about the state of science and how it conducts itself um, with regards to like spirituality and danger. Um, I don't really know too much about the way science is currently like conducting itself, but um, I think I know someone who does. It's, oh. it's Joe Hansen hey. from It's Okay to Be Smart. Uh, yeah, so uh, science, it turns out that most science, uh, it's not big, big, bad, scary stuff done by evil corporations. Uh, NASA, all the way down to the people who do basic research for health and uh, medicines. This is mostly funded by the government. Non-profit government. Huh, interesting. Yeah, yeah, if you go back, Michael Crichton has a science problem. He didn't believe in climate change. Interesting. If you go back to uh, Andromeda Strain, his first book, all the way through Congo, he kind of has a big scary science monster in the closet. So then really, you could say that, that Jurassic Park is about Michael Crichton's fear of science, that science is going to... Yeah, packed into a dinosaur shit. Right, right, of course. Yeah, with tiny arms. Yes, with yeah. Tiny always, arm. back always back to the tiny arms. Always back to the tiny arms. arms. All right, cool. Well, thanks, Joe. Yeah, yeah, no problem. Uh, see you later. See you later. Guy Mika points us towards some really interesting theorists and ideas related to uh, Marxism, socialism, and the media. Most notably, Noam Chomsky's idea of manufacturing consent, uh, which is about uh, ways that media behave and uh, report things to sort of um, influence the way people think and what they believe. Uh, so like directly related to ideologies and other stuff that we mentioned. So uh, yeah, it's a really good, really insightful comment. Clever girl. So while here at VidCon, a wild Mitchell Davis appeared. That's me. So uh, we thought we would talk to him for a second about dinosaurs and global market capitalism. Which make total sense to me. You think, yeah? Oh yeah. You're into it? Yeah, I guess. Okay. I mean, like you're saying, you know, you've got some dinosaurs that are just completely just taking over. Yeah. And then you've got other little guys who are like, hey, give me a chance. And then they get eaten. And then they get eaten. And, yeah. and you, know, they, you know what they say nowadays. What do they say nowadays? They say nowadays, if you don't do that, you're going to get eaten. So that makes sense. Survival of the fittest? No, like, no, one, no, says, no, no one, one says that. that. It's just, okay. You're going to get eaten. That's what they say. They point just like, you're going to get eaten. Just like capitalism. Yeah. So in our last episode, we talked a lot about the allegorical connection between dinosaurs and capital. Um, but since we're at VidCon and we're lucky enough to get Emily from The Brain Scoop, um, which if you don't watch Emily or The Brain Scoop, you absolutely should, uh, we thought we would ask her about the more literal connection between dinosaurs and capital. Um, so there are some bones that are worth like a lot of money. Millions. Millions of dollars. Mm -hmm. So why why is that? Well, I arguably they're worth just as much as, you know, precious and rare gems and minerals because they are so rare. It's not Whoa. every day that you find uh, an entire complete skeleton. And more than that, fossils and complete fossils, the more complete they are, the more scientifically relevant they're going to be. And the more we can learn from them, the more we're able to learn about, you know, dinosaur morphology. And so from there, you can kind of start to quantify the worth of something. Uh -huh. um, um, Do you know if there are like bidding wars on dinosaur bones? Oh yeah. yeah, they go to auction. Whoa. I mean like you'll have like, you know, a, a fancy diamond and a really expensive Louis V chair and then you're <laughs> going to have a, a, a T-Rex. Dino bones. Yeah, dino bones. With tiny arms. Yeah. 
Always back to the tiny arms. Always. Thanks again to all of our super secret and sudden special comment guests. If you want to see their awesome shows, we'll put links in the descriptions. Uh, this week's episode was brought to you by the awesome work of these very clever girls. And the tweet of the week comes from Yusuf, who is one of many people to point us towards the Pixar theory, which if you haven't seen it, it's mind-blowing.